rather than the area where they work best. And if we want to actually refine how we motivate people in organizations, what we're going to need to do is pay them well, get rid of a lot of these if then rewards, pay them well, give them a sense of, of autonomy, give them a chance to get better at something that matters, mastery, and attach them to some kind of purpose. That is a far better recipe for enduring motivation. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the show today. We drop great content each and every week, and we want to make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're going to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. All right. Well, welcome to the show, Daniel. We're excited to chat about your latest book, The Power of Regret, How Looking Backward Moves Us Forward. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad to be here with you guys. Awesome. Well, I have to say you wrote one of my favorite books of all time, Drive, and the book really covers how human motivation is counterintuitive and the carrot stick approach doesn't really work when it comes to motivating people and teams. Can you share a little with our audience what you've learned about motivation over the years? Because I think regret is often a powerful motivator. So so for that book, Drive, AJ, what I, what I mentioned, what I, what I did is I went back and looked at about 50 years of science on human motivation. And it, what it tells us is that human beings are complex, okay? We have, we have a lot of different motivations. But I think the, the core idea there in terms of, you know, work and school and individual performance is this. There's a certain kind of motivator that we use in organizations. Psychologists call it a controlling contingent motivator. Too many syllables for me. I call it an if-then reward. As in, if you do this, then you get that. If you do this, then you get that. Here's what 50, science, 50 years of science tells us, not about all rewards, but about if-then rewards. They're very good for simple tasks with short time horizons. So you want someone to stuff envelopes, pay them per envelope, no question about it. Human beings love rewards. And so when you give us a dangle of reward in front of us, we focus. However, the same body of research tells us that if-then rewards are less good for more complicated tasks with longer time horizons. Why is that? It's the same reason that that it, it narrows our focus. And when you're doing something more complex, more conceptual, more complicated with a longer time horizon, you want to look expansively. And so the, the problem is, is that we use these event rewards for everything rather than the area where they work best. And if we want to actually refine how we motivate people in organizations, what we're going to need to do is pay them well, get rid of a lot of these event rewards, pay them well, give them a sense of, of autonomy, give them a chance to get better at something that matters, mastery, and attach them to some kind of purpose. That is a far better recipe for enduring motivation. And I think many are feeling a lack of all three of those areas with the great resignation and the way that work is rewarded in the current environment. I think it's a great point. I, I, you know, you know at, at some level, and I, I use this term intentionally, that the last two years, I can't even believe it's been freaking two years, but the last two <laughs> years, have been a kind of an unmasking. Uh, and I think what pe a lot of people, I think part of the great resignation, not all of it, is people looking at their job and saying, this is a terrible job. I'm not being treated well. I have no sovereignty over what I do or how I do it. I am not getting better at anything. I'm not contributing. What's the point? And so at some level, it's a wake up call. I'll give you one more beat even on, even on, um, on autonomy. That, which is a, one of the central things that, that keeps people motivated over the long haul. Well, you know, when we think about autonomy, the, to me, the best way to understand it is to think about the opposite of autonomy, which is control. Human beings have only two reactions to control. We comply or we defy. That's it. And so if, but if, you, if you want people to actually engage, you got to give them some sense of self-direction. And this is why aut autonomy is so central here. And we've had we've had this two-year experiment in giving people greater autonomy and it worked i wrote a book guys i wrote a book 20 years ago called free agent nation about the rise of people working for themselves where i was like hey there are going to be a lot of people self-employed and we're going to be working at home and everyone says you're crazy you don't know what you're talking about you know <laughs> you can't trust people to work at home and it's like we can't possibly do that and then you know around the world 100 200 million people did it in four days and as they say in my home state of Ohio, that's a hard egg to unscramble, man. You know, like and, and we've shown that you can trust people. And if we go back to these very controlling mechanisms, 
it's a, it's a disaster for organizations and people are gonna leave. Now what we're always fascinated about with all of our guests is how they actually apply what they've learned from the science in their own lives. How would you say you've utilized the science around motivation to help find drive yourself? I'll give you two in particular. So one of them is, is what we know about from some great work from Teresa Mobile at Harvard Business School is that the single biggest day-to-day -day motivator on the job is making progress and meaningful work. So the days that we make progress are the days we're meaningful. The trouble is, is that in many organizations and certainly in, in remote work, we don't always have a sense of how we're doing. Are we making progress? So one of the things I've been doing probably for seven years, eight years maybe, is a progress ritual where at the end of every day, I write down, I, I have a running document, what I got done. And so the idea is you take a punctuation mark in your day, literally 30 seconds, and like what you got done. You know, it's like, like I'm, I'm a little bit more analog than a lot of people, but here I'm, show, I'm showing, you know, my, this is my list of things to do to today, which are in paper on, with a pencil. But, you know, have you, okay, have you guys ever had a to-do list? And you guys ever used a to-do list? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> okay, in the old days, in the, in the, in the Johnny's saying in the, in the late 19th century, when he would get off his stagecoach and go into his log cabin, he would sometimes use a, a, a to-do list. Okay, so here we go. So have you ever done this? You got a to-do list. You have the stuff on your list, but then you do something that's actually not on your to-do list. Have you ever then written that on the to-do list and crossed it off? That, that's what we're talking about. We drop great content each and every week and we want to make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're going to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. We want to be at, we want, we need a ritual in our days to help make progress. So that's what I do at the end of every day is I actually list the things that I got done, list the ways that I made progress. It's 60 seconds. At this point, I do it so regularly, it's hygienic. It's like brushing my teeth. One other thing that I do, especially when I'm stuck. Well, I'll give you an even better idea connected to this new book. All right, I got stuck on this new book, The Power of Regret. And it was so bad, I was spinning my wheels. I was like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do here? And for the first time ever, and I, I reached out and I said, you know what, I think I need a coach. I think I need to coach my way through this. And I talked to this coach, a lovely guy, for literally like 15 minutes. He said, okay, I know what it is you don't know the purpose of what you're doing. You have no purpose in this book. I think 15 minutes, he's already diagnosed it. And, and he says, and so here's what I want you to do, Dan. We're gonna, he gave me an assignment. He said, I want you, we're done. I want you to send me an email with the purpose of this book. And I'm like, oh man, that's a, such a, uh, you know, and and so I thought about it and I delayed and I delayed and finally I sat down and said, okay, like, why am I doing this? Like, what's the point of the exercise here? And I wrote this statement of like the purpose of the book. And I mean, I literally have it on my wall. I mean, I'm sure, you know, literally have it on my wall. And I look at that when I get stuck. And so a lot of times when we get stuck, so here's the technique. When we get stuck, we focus on how am I going to do this? So I'm a writer. How should I write this paragraph? How should I structure this chapter? And when I get really stuck, I shift from the how conversation to a why conversation. Why am I writing this chapter? Why am I doing this? And it is, it's unlocky. And I think it's true when we're dealing with people in teams. So, you know, I have some people who help me out in various projects, wonderful people. And sometimes I will say, you know, I can be a pain in the ass and say, okay, here's how you need to do this. But when I, when I, when I, some, I often resist that and say, okay, hey, you know what? Before we talk about it, let's talk about why we're doing this. Let's talk about why we're running this particular way of getting the message out. Let's talk about why we are writing the press release this way. And it's really, really helpful. I love that. And I certainly know in a lot of the work that we do at The Art of Charm, I will certainly get bogged down into a lot of points of, of getting stuck and forgetting why I'm doing things. And it's always been about taking a step back, asking what is the goal of this? What is the intention of what I'm doing here? Oh, oh, that's right. And, it's, and it centers me and brings me right back to what I was doing and why. So that is a very powerful frame.
Yeah, and, and the thing is what I like about it, what I like about the way that I do it, like, again, I, 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 I'm a, I have a huge bias toward easy stuff and small wins because I think we're more likely to do it. And so this progress ritual at the end of the day takes me 60 seconds. You know, if, if it was like, Dan, take a half an hour at the end of every day and write an essay that reflects on your sense of progress, never gonna do that. Even this thing about, even this, like, like this, this, this purpose statement here that I wrote to unblock myself, I just, I look over there. Sometimes I don't even read it, you know what I mean? But simply the, just having it within the site, it, so, so, so quick, I'm just a big fan of quick, easy interventions that help you make a little bit of progress. I think what we've found in a lot of our clients who have been struggling now with this move to remote work is the purpose was missing and a lot of the socialization and the connectedness of being in the office together was replacing that purpose and masking itself as motivation. And now that they've been disconnected, we don't really know if our work is meaningful. We don't really know if it's actually moving the needle. And now with no purpose, you wonder, well, why am I doing this job? And Many of us set, tend to focus on, well, financial earnings, but the pursuit of financial earnings is not a great purpose, <laughs> and it's certainly not going to lead to a meaningful life. It rarely does. I mean, you need to have a certain amount. I mean, you know, so I don't want to. I don't want to dismiss that. Like, I don't want to use this research on motivation as an excuse for people, for companies, organizations not to pay people fairly. You have to pay people fairly, and and people judge their pay with an eye toward that that fairness. If you don't pay people enough, you don't pay people fairly, they're not gonna be motivated. But the idea that it's just, a, it's just a, a, a bad theory of human motivation to say that human beings are singularly motivated by money and nothing else, and that money is the uber motivator for all people at all times. It's just, not, it's, it's just flatly not true. And that way of thinking about human beings, that we are merely these responders to stimuli in our environment, the right carrot, the right stick, it doesn't explain a whole course of human behavior. We do things because we like them. We do things because they're interesting. Amazingly, we do things because it's the right thing to do. We do things because they help us learn and grow. We do things because they give us meaning. And that's a big, that's not an, the only human motivation, but it's also part of human motivation. And so all I'm saying, and if you look at the research, it's like, hey, organizations, why don't you take a three-dimensional view of human beings rather than this narrow-minded two-dimensional view?